Hey, good morning, everybody. Good to see you. My name is Tyrone, one of the pastors here. And as you can tell from the video, we're in this Rooted series. It's been a really, really good series for so many of us as a lot of us are going through the life group journey, going through these Rooted workbooks. But we're in week number seven now of Rooted. Started off by looking about at who is God and how do we know God is real. The week number two of Rooted was how does God communicate with us? Talked about the importance of prayer, the kind of the how-tos of prayer. Then we uh, moved from there into uh, where is God in the midst of suffering? Tackled that suffering topic, which is a big, big one that trips a lot of people up in regards to does God even really exist because of all the suffering that's in the world. I talked about spiritual warfare and how real that is. And then for the last couple of weeks, we looked at how, can we, how we can make the most of our life. And I think that all of us want to do that, don't we? Just making sure you're awake here this morning, okay? You want to make the most of your life, don't you? And so a couple of weeks ago, we talked about living a life of servanthood and really following the model that Jesus gave us and living like Jesus and being a servant. And then last week, we talked about being people who pursue those God-given dreams that are inside of us. And I heard a lot, of, a lot of talk, a lot of feedback from that message. It seems like God really did some cool things from that message last week. And if you missed it, then I'd encourage you to go online and check it out. You can catch all of our mess messages online. And uh, it's just a great way to keep up with what's going on here and... You know, if you happen to be out of town or you're sick, then it's just a great way to just know uh, what's, what's still going on at Bell Road Church, and you can be in the loop. By the way, Louie, our webmaster, launched a new website this week, so we've got a new website. So at the very least, go on there and float around there and check it out. It looks super cool, but you can check out last week's message on there if you, if you missed it. So today, as we dive into this topic, I want to start off with a scenario. The scenario is your financial advisor, because that's your job. Does that sound like a good job? Anyone want to be a financial advisor? Okay. So you have two appointments today. And you, as an advisor, two appointments, you're going to meet with a, a poor widow, and you're also going to meet with a middle-aged rich man. Those are two appointments. So you meet with the, with the widow, and you learn that she lost her husband six years ago. Uh, she's been struggling financially. She's down to her last two dollars. That's all she has left, but she really feels that God wants her to give those two dollars to him. So what advice do you give her as a financial advisor? Well, typical advice would be, oh, you know, ma'am, that's so nice of you and, and generous of you, but I think God would want you to use some discretion here. Maybe you need to use this common sense that he's given you and you know, he knows your heart. He knows you want to give, but you probably should take your last $2 that you have and buy some food, take care of yourself. Make sure you don't neglect yourself. And then later on when you got more money, then yeah, just go ahead and give to God. And that would be a sensible answer from a lot of advisors. So you go to the next appointment. You're meeting with this rich middle-aged man and you, you find out he's a farmer. Okay, in the last few years, his crops have just exploded and he's made lots and lots of money and he's like man I just want to build bigger barns now and and store it all and and I just want to make sure I'm, I'm setting myself up for the future and then I really can retire if I do this I can travel the world and I can play and relax and hang out with my friends and 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 play golf all the time so what would you say to that man what would your advice be as a financial advisor a typical response would be like, man, that's, that sounds pretty cool. God's blessed you, brother. I can see you're a hard worker. So, man, maybe you should do that. After all, it's, it's, it's your money. It's your business. Uh, it's your crops. And so, by all means, go for it. And you might even throw, and I hope that I get the opportunity to do the same thing someday, too. You might even throw that in there, okay? So, those two responses and answers seem reasonable, don't they? Yeah, that's, that's, those are reasonable answers. But I wonder... What would God say to those two individuals? What would his answer be? Well, the truth is, we don't have to wonder because the Bible tells us exactly what he would say. So let's go to Mark 12, and let's look at this first story here in, in Mark chapter 12. And in Mark 12, we meet a poor widow. In verse 40, 41, this is where it starts. It says, Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put, and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put in two very small 
copper coins worth only a fraction of a penny. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in all that she had to live on. So what's this lady do? She puts in these two tiny copper coins. And uh, we see that this was all that she had. This was her last money. So what does Jesus do? He calls all of his disciples together and he says, hey guys, I want to point something out to you. And he, and he points out this, this poor widow and he says, look at that lady. And does he say, man, can you believe that she would do such a thing? That's just not wisdom with your money. You know, that's, that's not a very good decision. He doesn't say that, does he? He actually points her out and he regards her as wise. And he sets her up as an example for them to follow. And even a model for us. I mean, her, this example that we have, that she's modeling generosity and just a lifestyle of faith is still one that we read about today in God's word for generations. Yet if she came to many of us and maybe financial advisors today, they would have advised her to do differently. Okay, so you got this next story here in Luke chapter 12 is where we're going to go. Luke 12, and this is where we meet the rich man. Luke 12, verse 13, this is how it starts. It says, someone in the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. And Jesus replied, man, who appointed me a, a judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said to them, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And those words are perhaps more true today in our country, in our culture, than ever before, right? But maybe not so. It just feels that way because, uh, you know, deep down inside, all of us, no matter what our race is, our nationality is, our hearts are all the same. And we like our stuff, don't we? We love possessions. I heard somebody say once, it's okay to have stuff as long as stuff doesn't have you. Okay? So this is a very good and important statement that Jesus is making to us even today. A man's life does not consist of in the abundance of his possessions. We tend to think that, hey, I'm successful if I have lots of stuff, right? That's success, but that's not what Jesus is saying. And he told him this parable. The ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself but is not rich towards God. All right, so we meet this rich man here in that little story. He appears to be a good man. He's obviously a hard worker. If he's a typical Jewish man, he goes to the synagogue every single week and they would tithe to God. They would pray on a regular basis because that would be what most Jews did. But like any good businessman, he's saying, man, I'm, I'm getting successful here. Business is growing. And so he wants to expand by building bigger barns. Makes sense. So his purpose was to accumulate enough wealth so he could retire early and then he could just live on that and go and play and have some fun, which sounds like the American dream, right? Yeah, totally does. But what does God say about this? It's foolish. Interesting. He says, you fool. Now, by our cultural standards, the widow's actions would have been seen as unwise, and the rich man's actions would have been seen as wise. But God, who sees things differently, and he knows their hearts. Obviously, he has an unfair advantage there because he knows their hearts. He sees from a different vantage point, though. And we see, especially as you read throughout Scripture, you see that God views money differently than we tend to view money. He has this eternal perspective over everything, even money. And so my question for you and my challenge for you is what if you and I begin to look at our money in light of eternity? What if we begin to have that perspective about our finances? Now, if we take these two stories seriously, I think there's some important questions that, that need answered here, okay? One is, who gets elevated in today's society? Is it poor widows or rich fools? Who is it that gets all the attention? Who is it that gets 
put on the cover of magazines, right? They get the respect. Is it poor widows or is it rich fools? In our culture, that's who we admire and that's who we desire to emulate. Now, here's another honest question. You think about that first story. Jesus had the nerve to actually sit by the offering box and watch everyone give. Did you catch that? Why would he do such a thing? I mean, you got to think, how close was he to that offering box? Was he making people feel uncomfortable? He was obviously close enough that he noticed that tiny shriveled hand from the poor widow putting in two coins, and he even could tell that they were two tiny copper coins. That's how close he was. So it appears that Jesus was very much interested in what people were giving, doesn't it? <laughs> and then, to take it a step further, he called all the disciples together and made it an object lesson for them as he observed what was going on. Imagine that scenario playing out today. Wouldn't that be interesting if we posted someone right by the offering box and wa they watched you and everybody else as you, as you went and you gave and you gave. <laughs> and then you became the object lesson. Can you imagine that? This, that scenario is kind of uncomfortable for us, isn't it? Because we tend to view our money as very private. It's my business. It's my money. Don't talk about it. It's, you know, and even this whole subject of finances and money gets very uncomfortable because it's that big of a deal to us. Well, we think it's our business, but as you read through Scripture, you realize that God views it as his business, and he makes no apologies for it at all. He kind of views our whole life as his business, and... It doesn't stop with finances. He sees that as also his business. He, doesn't, there's, he makes no apologies for that at all. And if we could use our imagination, you might even see God still doing that as he's watching people, maybe gathering people around him and observing how we give. So what kind of example are we in how we give back to God? The question that we're wrestling with this morning really is this. How does God view money? What is his stance on money? That's the study from, from Rooted this week, and it is such an important question. We've got to have a good, healthy understanding of how he views it. I mean, we know how we view it. We know how our, our culture and our country views it. Okay, it's very, very important, right? Money is, is a god to a lot of people. I mean, I, I found some, some quotes this week. This, here's one from Oscar Wilde. When I was young, he said, I thought that money was the most important thing in the world. Now that I'm old, I know that it is. Okay, that's, that's, a lot of people would think that, right? Now, obviously, money is very important, isn't it? Uh, how about this one from Bo Derek? Whoever said money can't buy happiness simply didn't know where to go shopping. <laughs> it solves that, right? So, if you want to be happy, you've got to go to the right place, which is Walmart. Obviously, if you want to be happy, you go to Walmart, right? That's the obvious choice. Ken Hubbard said this, the safest way to double your money is to fold it over and put it back in your pocket. So there you go, right there. Do that little trick. You've doubled your money instantly like that. Zig Ziglar, popular leader, business guy. He said, money won't make you happy, but everyone wants to find out for themselves. How true is that one, right? Well, I've heard it won't, but boy, I just, I just, I, I got to find out for myself. I got to check this out. Got to see. Helen Gurley Brown said this, money, if it does not bring you happiness, will at least help you be miserable in comfort. And so that's some people's philosophy right there, too. Like, oh, well, if I'm going to be miserable, I might as well be rich, right? And I'll be rich and miserable. That's even better. Okay, but the question we're wrestling with is this. Is how does God view money? God clearly views money in a different perspective. It's an eternal perspective. And so what if you and I began to look at money that way? What if we looked at it in light of eternity? Do you know that money was the number two topic that Jesus talked about? Number one was the kingdom of God. Talked a lot about the kingdom of God. But number two was money. Why do you think that was? Do you think that Jesus just was obsessed with money? Like he just loved money? He's like, man, I just, this money thing here on earth is so cool. I just want to talk about it all the time. I love money. I want more money. Let me just keep talking about it. Do you think that was his posture and stance on money? Do you think he actually had an, uh, an indication on where our heart is in life and what would be maybe a big struggle for us in life? He probably realized, I got to talk about this a lot so it can sink into their hard hearts and their thick heads. I got to keep talking about it. I got to keep talking about it. I can keep talking about it because this is a big deal for us, right? And for many of us, we get uncomfortable, it's scary, it's hard, I, you know, it's, it's my business. 
But as we can see, Jesus made it his business, and he talked about it so much, it is the number two topic discussed in his life and his ministry. Which makes you realize that the Bible really didn't come from man. It came from God. Because if it came from us, like if you and I were, were to make this up and, and, or even just be an editor of it, there's some parts we would want to take out, isn't there? And I think a lot of the money stuff would be one of those places like, oh, let's just rip this out of here. Just, you know, that's, we don't need this, you know. And if we did that, which would be a, a temptation, we'd be missing huge chunks of the Bible because it's all throughout Scripture and generosity and giving, but also huge chunks of, of the teachings of Jesus because he talked about it so, so much. And Jesus made it clear when we follow him, it's really a call to just give our whole life. We come to surrender our whole life to him. Mark 8, 34, he says, it says that he called the crowd to him. So he's talking to the crowd and his disciples. And he said, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So that just shows you this encompasses my entire being, every aspect of my life. So can I live out that verse and not let it apply to my money? I can't. It also is going to affect my money and my possessions because it really, this relationship with Jesus encompasses my entire life. Love this quote by Randy Alcorn. He says this, he says, the Bible shows that our handling of money is a litmus test of our true character. It's an index of our spiritual life. Our stewardship of our money and possessions becomes the story of our lives. Very true. And I agree with that. So, God's obviously concerned with our money. And when we commit our life to following him, the goal really is that you and I would become as close to him as we possibly can. And that we would surrender every aspect of our life. Yes, even, even our money. And so I want to encourage you to be someone who gives. And be someone who is generous with your finances. And to look to, to God's word to find out how does he want you and I to handle finances. You see, we like to look to this book as a source of comfort, don't we? I just need strength and comfort, so I'm going to go to the Bible. We don't look at this as a financial book. But the truth is, it's that too. Because this book helps us in all areas of life. So I want to talk about four levels of giving. Four levels of giving that we can find ourselves on. And wherever you're at, I want you to know there's grace for that. There's no judgment for that. But I want to encourage you to grow from where you're at. So before we get to the first level... I think it's important to say there's this pre-giving level, okay? So before we get to level one, there's pre-giving. This is before I would ever give back to God. We've all been there. And maybe you're there right now. I want to encourage you to move from the pre-giving to level number one. Level number one is the basic level. This is where you get on the steps, as you can see from uh, the picture there. This is where you make your first gift to God. And so this is the beginning, the beginning of you and I honoring God with our finances, so it's a good place to start, but it's not a place that you and I want to stay. So that's the, the basic level. I would also include in that level the sporadic givers, those who give sporadically, like whenever they feel like it, or maybe when they feel guilty about it. Maybe they hear someone talk about it, they're teaching on it, like, ah, oh, I feel guilty, whatever. That's the sporadic giving. That's the basic level. And again, it's a good place to start. But I want to encourage you to move from that level to the next level. And the, level number two would be what I call the regular level. This is where I begin to give systematically or regularly. Okay? So it's a uh, regular meaning frequency. Okay? So it happens, you know, there's some frequency and a, and a rhythm to it. I also like to call it regular because they say that most American Christians don't give 10% of their income, but a lot of them do give on a regular basis. And so it's regular in the American Christian lifestyle but as you'll see later on, as we look at some scriptures, God wants us to give more than just that. That's what he calls us to. But it's regular in that regards as well as also to frequency. But there's two ways that you and I want to give. When we give, we want to make sure we give in a way that provides accountability and in a way that is identifiable. And the truth is we need accountability for every area of our life, especially finances. So we don't want to neglect accountability in the area of our finances. And we also want it to be identifiable because that, that means that somebody knows how and, 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 and that I did give. So let's look at a couple verses in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 16, Paul says this to the church in Corinth. He says, verses 1 and 2, Now, about the collection for God's people, do what I told the Galatian churches to do. 
On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with his income, saving it up, so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. So just those two verses right there, we can see and learn some things about giving regularly. So he says, set aside a, a sum of money in proportion to your income. That's what it says. So the Bible never says you have to give this amount. Okay? And when you reach this level of giving and when you finally give this much money, now you are a good Christian. Now you are able to really fully receive God's love. Okay? The Bible never says that. It always is in reference to really how much we make. So ultimately giving isn't about how much we make or how much we give. It's really about sacrifice and it's about obedience as we'll talk about a little bit more. But it's a way that I can honor God with my money as I give back to him. So the reason it honors God is because as I give back to him, I'm essentially saying, God, I'm so thankful for all that you've given me. You've given me life and, and health and my car and, and a brain and my job and ability to make money. And so I just want to give back a portion to you. And that's very honoring to God. So Paul says, hey, on the first day of the week, go ahead and set aside a sum of money. So you're very strategic and intentional about how much money that is. And bring it to church. Bring it to the temple. When you, when you gather, that's the first day of the week. They would gather on the first day. In that day and age, they actually got paid on the last day of the week. So everyone would collect their wages on the last day. And so he's saying, hey, the next day when you show up for church, bring that money and gather all that so that when I come, we don't have that special offering that I can just gather it all and use it, for, use it for God. So you see there, though, a regular pattern of giving. And I would encourage you to do the same. Have this regular rhythm in your life. So I mentioned we also want to make sure it's, a way, it's done in a way that's identifiable. I think that's important. And that scripture mentions that specifically. How we do giving identifiably here is we use the, the offering envelopes. These are the giving envelopes. Some people like to do it online. Doing it online is totally cool. Uh, it's what I do personally. I love using it online. It's easy and convenient for me. But some people love to use this because they, for them it's just a, a powerful act of worship. They like to bring it. And when we gather on Sundays, it's part of you know, their what they've done maybe for years. And so they like the act of giving to God at church in God's house. And that's totally cool too. And for some, they, may, they have a hard time making the transition because it feels unspiritual to give to God online. And then for others that, you know, maybe that's, that doesn't, that you know, you're not worried about that. For others of us, man, if I make it recurring and automatic every month, that, am I really worshiping God when it just automatically comes out? I don't even have to think about it. I don't know about you, but I do that with several bills and it's kind of nice. I don't have to think about that bill. It just automatically comes out. And, and, and so wherever you fall on that, it doesn't really matter how you do it. It just matters that we, we do it, that we give to God. So if you want to give online, you can do that. You can set it up to go out automatically. It's really all about you and I honoring God with our money. And so, yes, we can even do that with technology. But if you like to use this, you can use this. And we always collect these at the end of the service. And so using offer envelopes helps it, to be identifiable, and online too, by the way, helps us be identifiable, but also gives us a, a certain amount of accountability because then our leadership, and I do this for myself too, so my leadership knows that I am giving and that I'm giving on a regular basis. Again, accountability is so good for us. It is how we grow. Now, as a church, as a nonprofit organization, we're required to send out a letter at the end of every year so you can know how much you gave. We like to do that several times a year, so you get a letter several times a year, so you can just keep up on how you're giving. The cool thing about giving in church nowadays in our country is it's tax deductible. Thank you, Uncle Sam. So that's, that's not why we give, but it's kind of nice. What a blessing to have that in our country, to have that as a tax deductible thing. But more than that, remember, this is just a way that we are honoring and worshiping God. So... That is the, what I would call the regular level. So just like the basic level, you know, it's a good place to, to, to be, but you don't want to stay there. You want to move on to the next level. Level number three is really the, the, the goal we're heading towards, and that's the obedience level. This is when now I'm being fully obedient and returning the full tithe to God. The obedience level is when I'm being fully obedient to God in my finances and, it, you know, it's important that we're fully obedient. We don't want to be partially, partially obedient. Partial obedience is disobedience, isn't it? If you really think about it, yeah, that's, that's what it is. Like, what if I, I told my wife, been married to her for 14 years, but what if I said this last, this last year, Amy, for 40 out of 52 weeks, I was faithful to you. 
So that's, that's a pretty good percentage, isn't it? That's, that's pretty good. Don't you think? I'd, that's way above average, you know, whatever average is. But, and you know, what, you know what would her response be? She'd be like, eh, you're out the door. She told me after the first service, and she said, I'd buy a gun too. <laughs> okay, awesome. Note to self. Okay, but that's, that's me being partially obedient, and partial obedience is disobedience, is it? Isn't it? And so I want to move to that obedience level where I'm given the full tithe. And tithe literally means 10% or a tenth. And so as you look at Scripture, there's so much in Scripture about the tithe. And so don't take my word from this, please. I would encourage you to go and study God's word and what he has to say about this. And you actually will find that principle of a tithe in first fruits from Genesis all the way through the New Testament. So I just want to point out a couple. Malachi 3 is a popular one. This is important that you understand that this isn't Tyrone's opinion. I'm just teaching you what God's word says. And it's important that you and I know what God's word has to say about this. So Malachi 3, verse 8 says, Will a man rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how do we rob you? In tithes and offerings. You are under a curse, the whole nation of you, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty. And see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough to store it. Well, that sounds kind of good, doesn't it? So God isn't saying you just need to do this because I'm telling you. He's like, I will bless you as you do this. And he even throws out this, test me in this. So you can test him in this principle of tithing and even giving above that in offerings. And God promises, I will bless you. I will take care of you. I'll never forget the story that I read where an atheist came to church, and the pastor actually talked about giving and tithing. And so here's this atheist who obviously doesn't believe in God. And so he says, I'm going to prove to that pastor and this church that there is no God. I'm going to start tithing 10% of my income to this church. And he did it. And wouldn't you know, six months later, he's getting baptized in water because he had a radical encounter with Jesus, discovered how real he was, and committed his life to Jesus. All because he started tithing. He's like, I'm going to prove there is no God. And a simple act of, of how he handled his money and God began to work in his life. And he began a relationship with the one he didn't even think existed six months before. That's pretty cool, isn't it? So God says, test him in that. Okay, so that's Old Testament. What does New Testament say? Some people say, well, is it really a New Testament thing? Well, it is. And Jesus makes reference to it several times. Matthew 23 is one of them. He says this in Matthew 23, 23. What sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees? Hypocrites, for you are careful to tithe even the tiniest income from your herb gardens, but you ignore the more important aspects of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. You should tithe, yes, but do not neglect the more important things. So with these words right here from Jesus, we get really an indirect teaching on tithing. It's not a direct one. It's kind of indirect. It's kind of this assumption, yeah, keep tithing. So Jesus doesn't say, Tithing's not for us anymore. He says, yeah, you should tithe, but make sure you, you don't neglect the other more important things like living this Christianity thing out the right way, this relationship with God the right way, faith, justice, and mercy. Like you should love people and that should be demonstrated in your life. Okay, so it's not just about religious obligation and duty because he's talking to a bunch of religious leaders in this, okay? And this is right in the middle of his dissertation on you guys are all worried about the outside, but your heart is far from God. And so he's saying, hey, nothing wrong with tithing. Keep doing that, but make sure your heart is close to God, okay? And, and the same is true for us today. So if we were to study tithing, we can see this principle found all throughout Scripture, like I said. But in light of this, it's just important for us to know this. And remember this, everything we have is his. It's from him, it, it, it is his, and so ultimately it all belongs to God. Even my money belongs to him. So the question isn't, should I give to God? The question is, how much should I give back to God? That's really the question, right? How much should I give back to him? So that's the obedience level. But then there's another level that you and I can go to. This is the, the, the highest level, this is the peak and it's kind of limitless, limitless in where you would go. But I call this the generous level. This is where you and I move into that generosity arena of life. Where I'm giving not just 10%, but 11%, 12%. I'm moving up to 15% of my income. This is, as I move in that direction, this is where I really begin to break consumerism 
in my life. And consumerism is probably the biggest religion in our country today. And I'm breaking consumerism. This is where I really begin to discover the joy of giving. There's so much joy in this. And there's so much freedom that comes with giving to God and, and helping other people. These are the people that just love to be generous in helping you know, a kid get to camp. I love to give to a need. They love to you know, give even in special offerings. This is people who are discovering the reality of you reap what you sow. You ever heard that before? You reap what you sow. Okay, it's from 2 Corinthians 9, verses 6 and 7. So let me read verse 6 to you. 2 Corinthians 9, 6. I went to the wrong one. So what it says, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Come on, do you want to reap generously in your life? You've got to be generous. You've got to sow generosity. You ever seen that modeled in somebody? Someone who's just so, so generous? And generous people are fun to hang out with because they're attractive, they're not concerned with themselves. Okay, I've met some really good-looking people that were selfish, and that makes them not good-looking. But generosity is attractive. Everyone likes to hang out with people who are generous because those people just aren't selfish. And so you want to have this generous lifestyle. Then it goes on to say in verse 7, each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Now, Last May when we did a study in a series on giving and generosity and finances, we looked at this verse, and out of that, it was kind of spontaneous and unintentional, but out of that, at the end of our service, I thought, hey, let's do this. Let's, let's, when, we, when we go to give of our tithes and offerings, let's clap and cheer. Because God loves a cheerful giver, right? So let's just be cheerful as we do this. And it kind of stuck. It's kind of funny how we did it once. And it just every Sunday now, and if you're new here, you know that it still happens. Every Sunday. And so we really came from this verse of, man, as we give, we want to do it cheerfully. And just know that there's a joy that we have in giving to God. One last quote from Andy, Randy Alcorn. I love this. He says, I have found that cheerful givers love God and love him more deeply each time they give. To me, one of the few experiences comparable to the joy of leading someone to Christ is the joy of making wise and generous decisions or choices with my money and possessions. Both are supreme acts of worship, both are exhilarating, and both are what we were made for. And I agree with that 100%. There's nothing like leading someone into a relationship with Jesus. You have helped them change their life for eternity, and that feels good. But he's saying, hey, here's something else that compares to that, is being generous with our money and our possessions. I want to encourage you to get to that generosity level. To, you know, wherever level you're at right now, just take a step up, maybe, this week and this month. But the goal is that we would get to that generosity level. We'd be people who are generous, who just love to, to give. And we, we create this lifestyle and these habits that allow us to do so. I love it when I see people are supporting a Compassion International kid. We've done it for years. Judicale is somebody we pray for, we correspond with, and we support. And it's just $38 a month, but it's a huge, makes a huge difference in his life as he is getting school and he's getting trained also in, in the Bible. And it's just kind of a cool relationship that develops through organizations like that. Maybe you've heard of Charity Water or... Project Rescue. There's so many things out there that we, it's just, I love when I hear people are just supporting and giving. And it, obviously it feels good to give, but we want to make that a part of our life. I'll never forget when Amy turned 30 years old, she said, I, I don't want any presents. I don't want any money. I want all the money that I would get from people or gifts I would get from people. I want it all to go to Project Rescue. It's an organization over in India that rescues human trafficked girls. We threw this big, huge party at our church. And it was so cool to see Amy do this. But she says, everything that I get for my 30th birthday, I want to give straight to Project Rescue. And so everyone showed up. People who couldn't even show up for a birthday party, they were online giving and donating. I don't remember how much we ended up raising because it was so long ago when you turned 30. But uh, it was lots of, I'm so sorry, that was bad. That was a bad joke. <laughs> but that was just a cool act of generosity that profoundly impacted me even to this day. Who does that in America? I don't want anything. I just want to give everything away for my birthday. 
What an awesome act of generosity. This last week, tragedy struck the Montiel family. Some of you heard about it, know about it, it's all over the news. So now their sister, daughter, is having to adopt some nieces. Two girls, right? Niece and nephew. Niece and nephew. So now the Montiel, the Nostrum family, is, now has some new cousins in their family because their mom and their dad were both killed. It's a tragic, tragic story. It was all over the news. And so what the family did was, I don't know the whole story, you can ask them about it, but it's just a powerful, powerful picture of generosity. These two, these two kids, five and six years old, have no mom and dad anymore. So their sister decides, I'm gonna, I need to take these kids in. And wanted kids for years. Could, couldn't, didn't have any, but now has the opportunity to adopt a niece and a nephew. And so it's amazing how God can orchestrate tragedy and bring good. But obviously there's lots of money and finances that's needed from this. And so they set up a GoFundMe account online and the goal was $10,000. The community rallied, it was on the news. People have given, maybe some of you have given to that GoFundMe account. But would you know that I just asked Rosemary before the service, it's right around $45,000 that people have given to the family so they could take care of these two kids. That, my friends, is a picture of generosity. And I love that. You see, it's not just about, you know, I've got to give to God and the church and stuff like that. It's about a lifestyle of how can I help the world? What can I do to make the world a better place by being generous, not just keeping this all to myself? I think that's how God has called us to live. Don't you? Man, there's a powerful connection between our spiritual life and our attitudes and our actions concerning our money and our possessions. Huge connection. You know, really our use of money and possessions, it's a decisive statement of our eternal values. Where I put my money really shows what kingdom I belong to. Do I belong to the kingdom of the world or am I part of God's kingdom? So my encouragement to you, my challenge to you is that you would look at money the way God does. And that's with eternal perspective. What if you looked at your money and possessions in light of eternity? For some of us, that might change everything. For those of us, that might just be that encouragement to keep moving forward and to be generous. Why don't you stand to your feet? We're going to pray. You know, I, uh, I love talking about this. Last week's message was one of those topics we talk about dreams and pursuing your dreams. It's fun how, and funny how we, excited we get about that, right? Oh, that's awesome. I want to pursue that. You know, but then we talk about this. We're like, oh, this is kind of, this isn't as exciting. But can I say... And I get that because sometimes it just kind of it feels uncomfortable for us. But can I just say I think that this, this topic is more important than our dreams topic because this is foundational and so important in how God is going to work in our lives and how he's going to use us as we move forward in life and pursue our dreams because finances is a huge part of our discipleship and how we follow Jesus. So this is so important. I love that this rooted study hits this because this is sometimes a neglected area of our life. But I want to encourage you to grow in the area of giving. Honor God with your wealth, with your first fruits. Be generous in what he's given you. Everything's his. So let's, let's show the world that we're different and handle our money and possessions in light of eternity. Why don't you join me? Let's pray right now. Lord, thank you so much for all that you've given and done for us, Lord. We could go on for days just thanking you, God. But we really just recognize that everything about us is yours. Our hopes and dreams, our wants, our desires, our family, all our situations, our struggles, our hurts, and even the financial part of our life. Lord, it's yours. We give it all to you. And God, in that, we're just so thankful that we can trust you, that you take care of us. And you give us more than we could ever ask or imagine for as we trust you in all areas of our life. So I pray, God, that you help my friends here, help my friends to trust you in the area of finances. For some, maybe this has been something that's tripped them up and they've struggled with for years. Maybe they've resisted this. Lord, I pray that this new season of life would bring freedom into their life financially and in so many other ways simply because they walk in obedience financially. Lord, that you pour open the floodgates of heaven and bless them as they trust you and walk in obedience 
Lord, I pray that for my friends. Do a new work, a new thing. Give them a new season of life as they move forward and trust in you financially. Lord, I pray for maybe those that are here this morning and they haven't fully committed their life to you and and trusted you, Lord. Maybe today's the day they do that. So before they really take that step financially, they just need to take that step in their life and commit their life to you, Lord. Lord, I pray that they would see how much you love them and care about them and that following you is the best decision they could ever make in their life. I'd love for you to keep your eyes closed right now because in light of that, I just want to give a few of you an opportunity right now to respond to committing your life to Jesus. So in a moment, I'm just going to count to three. And if you're here this morning and say, ah, Tyrone, that's me. I need to begin there with committing my life to him. I'll just ask you to raise your hand. Maybe you've done it before. You need to really recommit. Or maybe this is the first time you've ever made the decision. So eyes closed right now. And the count of three, just go ahead and slip your hand up. And I'm going to, I'm going to pray for you right after that. One, maybe this is the first time you're making this decision. Two, maybe you're, 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 you're recommitting to him. Regardless, three, lift your hand if that's you. Thank you. Thank you. You can put those hands down, guys. Thank you. Anybody else? So yeah, that's me, Tyron. I need to commit my life to Jesus. Anybody else here? Why don't you all go ahead and pray with me right now? And I'm just going to pray a prayer and And I just love for you to agree with me in this prayer because all of us are still so thankful for Jesus and who he is and what he's done for us. But man, for those of you that raise your hand, this is really a a prayer of dedication and commitment. So I want to just pray along with me. Agree with me in this prayer and usually own it for yourself. Jesus, thank you so much for your incredible love. I recognize that I've been doing my own thing and I've been rebellious towards you and your ways and I just want to commit to following you. So I ask for forgiveness for my sins, my rebellion. Fill me with your love and your grace. I receive your forgiveness. And I believe, Jesus, that you died for me on the cross for all those sins that I've committed. And I just invite you to be the Lord, the Savior, the leader of my life. Help me to follow you for the rest of my life and to stay committed to you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Can you give a hand to those that just prayed that prayer this morning here that committed their life to Jesus?